Hello, brothers and sisters. This is your boy BC. Welcome back to another based LDS video. Uh, today we're going to give a run at our first, my first response video, and I've chosen a video that kind of highlights what I talked about in my last video on antis um, and the approach they take and how honestly you can model it after the things you read from Sherem, Nehor, and Korahor in the Book of Mormon, um, and. It's nothing new under the sun. The things this guy are going to come up with, you've heard it before from other places, other sources. There's nothing new. Now, there is one twist here in that this person claims to still be an active, engaged, practicing member. But he's clearly let go of everything except for the Book of Mormon. He just he has no use for for anything going on and he's here to put a lot of doubts into our minds and show us that we need to kind of reject the church and just stick to the book of mormon and that that i don't know what faith or salvation come by that alone um and so this video also has to do with my previous video to that which was on the mormon temple endowment and this is a member talking about the endowment change and how it's problematic and how the whole idea of the temples and the history and doctrine of the temples is problematic. So without further ado, let's get started, shall we? Mormon Temple Endowment Changes Many of us have noticed recently some major changes to the endowment ceremony in the temple like lots of changes. Last year there were some major changes, this year there are new changes. It seems like every time we go, it gets changed. I won't go into specifics about all that has changed because that would take hours. I just wanna talk about the fact that it does change because I have a few sincere questions. First, where is the original revelation introduced in the endowment? Just out of curiosity, does it even exist? Where is it stored? Who has access to it? Whose handwriting and fingerprints on it? And more importantly, who received it and when? How was it received? And why is it being hidden and not published? I was surprised the first time I did a keyword search for endowment in the Book of Mormon, and it came up with nothing. Zero hits. Remember, the angel Moroni testified to Joseph Smith that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of Christ's new and everlasting gospel, but it contains no mention of an endowment. So I looked in the DNC. Nowhere in that book is any revelation that explains what an endowment is, or commands anybody to do it, or anything about what it contains. Nothing. Not even anything about all the stuff that is not sealed under threats of secrecy within the endowment. There's nothing there. I did find two sections of the DNC that contain the word endowment, sections 105 and 110, but they only mention the word in passing without any explanation. And what I find fascinating is that both those sections that have the word endowment were added to the DNC after Joseph Smith's death. DNC 105 was added late 1844 by John Taylor, even though it claims to have been received in 1834, 10 years earlier. Section 110, which is claimed to have been received in 1836, was not brought forward in the DNC until 1876, 40 years later. Something smells fishy here. But in So, now I'm going to come back to some of the first things he mentioned, but I want to stop right here and talk about this is your first sign that he's half-hearted. These these searches for information are are half-hearted. Um, he looked up in the Book of Mormon for the word endow. He looked in the section. He looked in the Doctrine and Covenants and found two sections, and that's true. But that's the extent of any research, right? What else did he do? We're gonna find out. That's all the legwork he put in, and here he goes, and you hear him. They claim this, but this was done. So, but they claim this. We have the Joseph Smith papers. You can go online and trace everything written from the prophet Joseph Smith or about him, just from the beginning of the from the be, from the start of the church. We have Wilford. Oh. <laughs> Ah, uh, Wolford Woodruff's, there we go, diaries. We have 
Brigham Young's statements. We have Willard Richard's statements. We have, we have so much history preserved. And so let's just talk about his first question. Remember, I just went to LDS.org, ChurchOfJesusChrist.org, excuse me, they've changed it. I just typed in Temple Endowment. Arranged in the upper floor of the red brick storehouse. Nine people given the endowment. They were charged not to write it down. They committed it to memory. And it wasn't until they had the St. George Temple built that Brigham Young told Wilford, write down the ceremony, and then we'll distribute it so there's a common consensus as to what the endowment ceremony should be. So there wasn't going to be any changes. So let's keep in mind, they did everything from memory for years. Willard Richards testified this was a revelation. Brothers and sisters, it's not hard to find. I actually think he had to go out of his way to not find that one section on the church website. And again, you can go to, you, you can look up the diaries. You can look up Joseph Smith papers. I read a book. <laughs> I read a book I shouldn't have. But on my mission called Unpublished Revelations of the Church. And they were Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and John Taylor, and it listed when it was when it was written, where it was at, but they weren't selected to be added to Scripture. Not all revelation is Scripture. Some revelation is set aside. But the Temple Endowment, it's not a secret, but it is sacred. Elder Packer has talked on that length. So many apostles have talked on that length. But Elder Packer and Elder Talmadge in their books on the temple. Sacred, not secret. Nibley outlines that the Egyptians ran a pretty close counterfeit. I mean, we, we, read, in the book, we read in the book of Abraham. Pharaoh sought for the blessings of the fathers, right? He was going to, he was going to do everything he could to set up a similar system of organization and government. He was a good man. He was doing everything he could to be legitimate, but he didn't hold authority. But they copied it. They copied it. And again, not that the temple is exactly what, not like, not like the temple is exactly like what happened in the pyramids. But for the time, it was the counterfeit of that. So, let me just say, again, I he looked up in the Book of Mormon, and he looked up in the Doctrine and Covenants. And yeah, he, he found out that those sections were added later, but we know how Scripture's added. We know how things were added sometimes after, right? They tell you. The church is plain about these things. We don't need to question that. That's not the kind of stuff we need to worry about. So let's continue. All the versions of the DNC, the 1832 version, 1835, 1844, 1876, there is no explanation, discussion, or revelation about the endowment or what goes on in it. Nothing. So again, who received the original endowment revelation? When? And why is it being hidden and not published? Second question. Where are all the intervening revelations that changed the endowment over the years? How were they received, and why are they being hidden and not published? As a lifelong member of the church, I was very surprised last year to learn, for the first time, from Wikipedia of all places, that there were a number of drastic changes made to the endowment ceremony from when it began in the late 1840s through 1990. Depending on the source, it apparently used to contain stuff that I at first didn't believe because it was so shocking. I was disgusted. When I read about what the endowment used to do, I was so disturbed by it that I couldn't continue reading. But I can't find anywhere, even the church apologists, that contradict what Wikipedia says were done. And so who knows? Things like that. Wikipedia is one of his key sources. Think on that for a minute. He's looked at the Book of Mormon. He's looked at the Doctrine and Covenants and Wikipedia. I can think of a handful of books that talk on what happened has happened in the temple. One of the best is doctrinal. I wish I had the book. It's in the storage unit in Denver, but it's the the book. Someone took got a hold of uh, President Woodruff's journals and talked about his doctrinal development as he was temple president and president of the church, 
and the changes made to the endowment. Remember, these things used to last all day, and they would refine and streamline and refine and streamline and refine and streamline. And I want you to think about this. For those people that have to travel thousands of miles, that might the temple might be a once-in-a-lifetime. If not for those changes, just on this one subject, just the length, if not for those changes, those people are going to do the endowments for themselves and nothing else. Now we have the luxury of doing our endowments and then doing endowments for our dead and doing several sessions in one day. That's beautiful. That's the gospel in action. That's the Lord giving us what we need here a little, there a little. Here's this, will the saints keep it? Here's this, will the saints keep it? Here's this, will the saints keep it? And as we keep our covenants, as we respect the sacred, we're given a little bit more. Nothing is etched in stone. This brother's looking for stone. Why change? Why did he do this? How disgusting. There was a reason for it. Let's think just about the baptisms. Let's, let's, let's keep this simple. We can talk about the baptisms for the dead. When the saints first heard about baptisms for the dead, they were so excited. They ran to the river. They're baptizing men for women, women for men. And Joseph Smith said, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. There's an order. There's a process. And we need to record these things. The same thing happened with the endowment. Eliza Snow talks about the beauty of it. Wilford Wood, uh, Willard Richard says this was received by revelation. There's a member who's a Freemason <clears throat> who says that he that the, the endowment's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. It has nothing to do with masonry. And the changes to the endowment leave him, I, my words here, breathless. I, that's how I'm going to put it. If I, if I remember, if I, if I remember, he was the same guy. But, yeah, things changed. Yes, at first, we needed to be reminded of how serious these covenants were, so we made very serious covenants to keep these things sacred and to keep them to ourselves and not to cast, as the Bible puts it, pearls before swine. I get it. But just to say I was disgusted and couldn't keep reading. There you go. You couldn't keep reading. You were done. You closed your mind. The graphic representations of violent death for anyone who reveals secrets of the endowment ceremony? Yuck. But apparently a lot of that got simplified in the 1920s when the church came under enormous political pressure and some of the graphic details were cut out of the endowment. But some repulsive things continued even until 1990, when again drastic changes were made and the meanings behind the tokens were taken out of the endowment ceremony. Again, I had a hard time believing that what I read was true until I called a trusted older friend and asked if it was true. They told me very reluctantly and hesitantly that yeah, what I read was accurate. It was disturbing to say the least. So now I have the same questions as, as with the original revelation. How are these, quote, revelations, quote, to change the endowment received? And why are the changes hidden within the church? And members like me have to look to Wikipedia to find out about our own religion. Why all this hush and secrecy? Which brings to us to the current day. Okay. Why all this hush? Why all this secrecy? This comes back to keeping the people in confusion. Keeping the people in. That was the accusation of the, the antichrists to the prophets, right? that they were doing things to keep us confused, that they're doing things to keep us in bondage. My in-laws are the most temple-going people I have ever met. And we've talked lightly about changes, never getting into great depth and detail, but they realize and recognize the consistency of the gospel being taught in the endowments of the symbolic nature of what's going on in the temple and how it builds us in character and reference to Christ. 
Nothing of great significance that pulls us away from Christ has been changed. It's been enhanced. And when you hear from people about this change in the endowment, that's what they talk about. Again, they don't go into the specifics, but they all say, I've learned more and I know, I now know how much closer I am to Christ because of this. Those, to me, those are the consistencies across the board. And I'm, and I'm going to say this again, unpublished revelations, revelations that are kept, but not put out for everyone. And let's keep in mind, let's keep in mind, this is the unanimous consent of the brethren to make these changes. The revelation is presented, discussion is had, prayers are made, probably more discussion, more prayer, refining, completing until coming to it, and again, sacred but not secret, you don't throw this stuff out to the public. You just don't. As a military man, I understand the nature of secrecy, to keep things safe, to safeguard lives. This keeps people from belittling faith and ruining themselves, talking about things they don't know. This is sacred, not secret, and what's not made available to the public is available to those that go to the temple. Go to the temple. The baptistry, the initiatories, the endowment, the ceilings, they have cards, they're reading. They're all the same. Every temple's the same. Language change, that's it. But the words, the meaning, the covenants are all the same. We know what's being said. We know because we're in there hearing it. It's the unbelieving public being kept from this because they don't need to know. They're not ready to know. They have not entered in at the gate. Third question. Where are the revelations for all these current changes at? How are they being received? Why are they being hidden and not published? Twice in the last year, when we've gone to the temple, the endowment session was prefaced with an explanation that it had been changed. I was expecting little changes, but these were major, especially in substance. Even some of the laws we swear to were drastically changed. Like, wow. So how did this happen? Was a revelation received? How was it received? And why haven't these changes been published in the Doctrine and Covenants, in the Ensign, or at the very least in the Church website? According to the Church, our eternal salvation depends on these changes. So why are they not published? Forth. I remember during the changes we made that were made last summer, we were told in the temple to not discuss the changes at all. We couldn't talk about them. Why all the secrecy? Why is no one allowed to talk openly about these changes in the endowment? If it's a- I've talked about that enough, right? I I don't know how to make it clear without getting into more specifics and breaking out books and make this video entirely way too long. But for those of you that have been through the temple, you understand. You absolutely do. For those of you struggling with the temple, and I'm not going to lie, I'm one of them. I don't struggle with my faith in the temple, but man, I've never had a good experience. It's never gone well. I've never had a spiritual manifestation about the truth of the temple, but I do believe that what happens there is for our salvation and benefit. And I have that kind of a secondary faith because of my in-laws, because of things my parents have told me, the things they things they experienced in the temple. I've had one good experience when I went to the temple. See, the ceiling to my wife and my daughter. Beyond that, the, my first time to the temple, I remember one of my friends, when I'm getting ready to go through it, and he's like, okay, it's a little weird. You're not going to understand. This stuff's going to happen. If you, We'll talk about it when you're done, but don't worry about it. Church is true. And I spent my first time going through the temple waiting for the weird. It never happened. And then when the temple experience was done, my first time through, you know, the initiatory and the endowment, 
And they're like, okay, you're done. Get dressed, go home. And I'm like... And I, I had been so busy listening for the weird or looking for something odd or awkward or off. It, it ruined it for me. It absolutely ruined it for me. And I tell you this, I'm not a big scripture guy, but the things I heard, I didn't think were weird. The things I heard didn't bother me or shake me. I understood. I could listen and go, okay, this is kind of a Bible thing. Okay, that's kind of a, from what little I understood. But I could put little key points and enough to go, all right, so I established a little bit of faith in the temple. And then just this bad thing or that bad thing would happen when I was in the temple, which is funny more than anything else. But, yeah. Yeah, so, again, this emphasis on why don't we know? Why aren't? Because you have to pray, you have to study, you have to attend. Truth will be made known. Finally, the fifth question. Why does the Lord himself constantly have to change the endowment if this is coming from him? The thought that pops into my head is, if this is truly from him, does he not even know what the correct endowment is? And why does he have to constantly revise and change it? We are told that prophets can see around corners. Why wouldn't the Lord himself be able to know six months in advance if he's going to once again need to be changing his own endowment, or six years in advance, or 600 years? Claiming these changes come from Christ seems like mockery to me. And if he still hasn't figured out what his endowment is, will there ever be a time when he will finally figure it out once and for all, and these supposed eternal covenants will stop changing? I hate to sound disrespectful here, but this is an honest question. One I would expect to be asked myself if I was doing a similar thing. When I get to the point where I just want to stand up and yell, why are there no answers? Why is everything so hidden and secret? Then I know it's time to look to the Book of Mormon. I'm so grateful for the Book of Mormon, the one part of our entire church that doesn't change every couple of months. All right. See, he keeps reiterating the same problem. When will the Lord know? Why doesn't why does the Lord make up? The Lord gives us what we need when we can handle it as we can handle it. Look at the progression of the Hebrews under Moses. They were not ready for everything, so things were given to them piecemeal. The church was built up under Moses and succeeding prophets. And they were given what they could handle as they went. And they misinterpreted a lot of what happened and what they got. The Lord gives us what we need and he gives us time. We grow into the character of Christ. I don't see a problem here. I don't think this is the Lord not knowing what's going on. I don't think this is the prophet not knowing what's going on. I don't think this is the members not knowing what's going on. It's none of those. This is... We're giving, we're given here a little, there a little. Milk before meat. A greater share of the light. And as we get closer to the Lord's coming, we need that greater share. He needs stronger, better saints to survive these last days. And the church culture and mindset had to change with time so we could grow into it. That might sound a little harsh, but I think you know what I mean. It's the one part of our church that was given to us by an actual angel, translated by the power of God through interpreted stones. It's the one solid piece of scripture I can actually have confidence in. So what does it say? First, I looked at the idea of a secret gospel. First Nephi, come ye near unto me. I have not spoken in secret. From the beginning, from the time that I was declared, have I spoken. Second Nephi, For behold, my beloved brethren, I say unto you that the Lord worketh not in darkness. I researched 73 times in the Book of Mormon where we're taught to abhor secrecy, and especially secret combinations and oaths and covenants. For example, And it came to pass that they did have their signs, yea, their secret signs and their secret words, and this that they might distinguish a brother who had entered into the covenant. Behold, I am Gideon High, and I am the governor of the secret society of Gadianton, which society and the works thereof I know to be good. And they are of ancient date, and they have been handed down unto us. Sounds familiar. 
Yield yourselves up unto us, and unite with us, and become acquainted with our secret works, and become our brethren, that ye may be like unto us. In either, the Lord worketh not in secret combinations, and whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations to get power and gain, until they shall spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed when the Lord states clearly that if we do secret works, we are going to be destroyed, I sit up in my seat. And he says it over and over in the Book of Mormon. Secret this is twisting of doctrine and scripture. And we saw that with Korahor, right? Do you, do, do you believe in Christ? No. Do you understand scriptures? Yes. Well, if he, didn't, if he did, he would have seen Christ there, right? Look at how he's twisting scripture. This isn't just a small part of the church being initiated in the temple. Everyone who has been baptized is invited to the temple. This is not a secret combination or a secret work. He is twisting the scripture and the doctrine. And he's using the Book of Mormon to do it. But this is a twist. He's gone astray. Either he does not understand what he's reading, or he's genuine, genuinely attacking the church through disingenuous means. This is not an honest critique. There's no way it can be. From the research, from the way he reads the scriptures, from the way he interprets this, everyone's invited to the temple from the age of 12 up, right? 12 to what? 18 for baptisms. 18-ish and up? Endowments. Married. Sealing. And heck, if you're a young single adult, I don't know, maybe you still, maybe maybe you can't now, but I'm assuming you still can. You could go and still be sealed on, for on behalf of the dead. You didn't have to be married for, to, I went to the, I knelt at the altar and someone across me, sealed for the dead. None of these things are secret, but they are sacred and they're kept from the outside church. Secret combinations, secret oaths, secret covenants lead directly to destruction. The Lord worketh not in secret. Next, I asked, what does the Book of Mormon say about writing down and publishing Christ's gospel? Quite a bit. For example, 2 Nephi. And upon these I write the things of my soul, and many of the scriptures which are engraven upon the plates of brass. For my soul delighteth in the scriptures, and my heart pondereth them, and writeth them for the learning and profit of my children. All right, look, I'm going to fast forward a bit here. Again. The scriptures are for the entire world. The temple is for the church. The world is invited to read the scriptures to come unto Christ. In the scriptures we find Christ. We can knock and he answers. But the, t the temple is another thing entirely. Nothing's being hidden from the church. But sacred things are being held back. So let's, I'm going to fast forward here. Let's go. All right, here we go. I ask myself this all the time about our leaders. Have they read the Book of Mormon? If so, why don't they teach these truths? And why don't they write down and publish something so important as revelations on the endowment, which supposedly affect our eternal salvation? There it is. The direct finger point at the Lord's anointed, the apostles, the first presidency. This is an accusation that they are keeping us in the dark and in bondage. That there's something shady going on there. That there's something untoward. There's nothing like that. Finally, I looked at what the Book of Mormon says about Jesus constantly changing his own gospel. Here are some things that I found. 
Alma, the Lord cannot walk in crooked paths, neither doth he vary from that which he hath said, neither hath he a shadow of turning from the left or to the right, or from that which is right to that which is wrong. Therefore his course is one eternal round, and he doth not dwell in unholy temples. Does anyone think the gospel is being changed? There's no change in the gospel. <laughs> you, there's no change. The gospel is consistent. But more light and more knowledge is being shed upon those who have walked through the gate of baptism and then endured to walk through the temple. And that is available to all members. move forward again believe that the unchanging unvarying constant eternal christ of the book of mormon is the person giving conflicting revelations every couple months that constantly change for an eternal requirement for heaven it is hard to believe the angel moroni declared to joseph the fullness of the everlasting gospel is contained in the book of mormon as delivered by the savior to the ancient inhabitants I know that the words that Jesus spoke that were actually written down in the Book of Mormon contain the fullness of Christ's gospel. His true gospel does not change. It's right there. It's out in the open for everyone to see and read and learn. There's no secrecy. There's no lying. There's no changing. I may never be able to ask my sincere questions about where the endowment comes from or why it's always changing. And so I hold on to the Book of Mormon, my iron rod, fixed, unbending, and true. He may never be able to ask his questions. That's what he's doing now, right? But now he's doing it to a bunch of people through YouTube. I wonder what he says in Sunday school or priesthood. I'm going to say this because it's a common complaint. And, and we're going to go ahead and finish up here. You can ask your questions in church. We're not commanded to be ignorant. We're commanded to read. We're commanded to study. We're commanded to exercise our faith. Now, would I say we should read some anti? No. Are there things we should not read? Yes. Are there things we can not read? No. That is different. There is a difference between should not and cannot. And there is no question that you cannot ask in church, in Sunday school, or in priesthood where you can get answers. Or to your ministering couples or partnerships, wherever, you know, like here in South Dakota, my, I, it's ministering couple because it's me and my wife. We're so spread out we don't have partnerships. Elders Quorum and Relief Society. It's just, there we go. You can ask questions. But I'm going to say by the research this guy has done, he's not interested in real answers. And if he's done better research, he knows he can't use those answers. He can't use what he found because he'll. it knocks down everything he's complaining about here. Brothers and sisters, this gospel is true. This gospel is unchanging. But we are mortal, fallible creatures who are growing individually and collectively as a church. It's Think about the leaps and bounds we've taken from Joseph Smith on. He starts off by saying, have the brethren, he started off this last clip, have the brethren even read the scriptures? Have they read the Book of Mormon? Don't they know? That's straight. Quarrel Nehor, and Sherem. You don't understand. I've got knowledge. I've got light. But you don't. Right? 
He's hoping to, this guy here is hoping to win a rhetorical battle that is empty and meaningless because anybody can see that this is a nothing burger. The temple is sacred, not secret. The revelations, sacred, not secret. And any who go to the temple, which is everyone, can hear the revelation and feel the spirit for themselves. And if they don't feel the spirit, they can pray and work at it. And some people will have to work at receiving that revelation for years. And they may not receive that revelation till the next light, till the next life. But those who are faithful, that pray and work for that revelation, will still receive other revelations to help them stay on the path and build their faith in the meantime. Joseph Smith is not a liar. He did not hide the revelations. He passed them on to Brigham Young. They kept them verbal for 30, 40 years, whatever it was. They wrote it down, but they keep the endowment and other ordinances, words to the other ordinances in the temple. And let's be clear, these things have been published. I had a cousin in Iowa, non-member, and I was visiting and I was returned missionary, so I knew a little bit more. And she's like, guess what I found at a garage sale? This notebook was up in this guy's attic and it's got your endowment in it. Can you explain this to me? Because this seems so cool. And I'm like, what are you talking about our endowments in it? And she handed me the notebook and this guy had typed written pages of the entire endowment ceremony as it was being done in 1980s. I mean, this was an old notebook and I read this in like 97, 98. It was already it was the the guy had held on to it till he died and the, all this stuff was being sold off at an estate auction. And I read it and I'm like, "Hey, can I have this?" And she goes, "Sure. Will you tell me about the temple?" And I gave her the basic Mormon missionary. This is what the temple is. And I took the endowment ceremony away from her because she had no business reading it. Because she could not understand it. She thought it was cool. She thought it was interesting to see stuff about Eve. Because it was great to see a greater feminine representation in the gospel. In church. That's all well and good. But that's all it was for her. That information was doing no good for her. And it would have not done anything for anyone else she showed it to or shared it with. I destroyed the, 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 the binder. I could go to the temple and hear the endowment. I could go and hear it in its current form. And yes, it's changed a little bit since then. Different films, updates, faster. All so that we can do more work. All so we can draw closer to Christ in the time we have. Because the world's increasing in, wick with, in wickedness and we need this. There's no mystery. There's no secret. There's no cover-up. We're blessed that this is how it's done. We're blessed to be able to participate and see the fruits of the revelations. That's what we're getting is the fruit of the revelation. And maybe some of us are praying. And maybe some of us are receiving some revelation for ourselves so we can better understand the endowments. And to those people, congratulations and God bless you with your work. Keep going. Anyway, brothers and sisters, that's all I have for right now. i got to get my daughter to her play practice she's got too many activities um but i love you i thank you for being here and listening thank you if you like this video hit like share it with someone who needs to hear it write back and tell me what i could have done better this probably went way too long and sorry for all the pauses my daughter kept coming up and down wait anyway, love you all have a good night peace out